This is a water mass transit panel. I'm sorry to have cut off on the slide. Uh, just a couple of things. There are surveys in your folders. If you could please fill them out and uh, return them to any of the volunteers at either of the registration desks. If, um, if you have any food items that you brought with you, please um, take them out and leave. Uh, Okay, one more. So, uh, so we'll wait just a couple of minutes um, for we have all of our panelists to start. Uh, we will have um, we will have a couple of volunteers who are waiting for to hand out um, note cards, and then we will write down any questions you have in those note cards, and they will be handed back to our panelists, um, and they will then read the questions and respond. Okay, well, I have an idea to be good to start off and we can uh, say a little something about what we're going to say. Thank you for attending. This is one of the best uh, books. Yeah, everybody, everybody, everybody has Everybody, okay, can you hear me in the back now? Hi, I'm John Watts, not Kent Barwick, and there are a lot of, uh, particularly women, that are uh, sorry to hear that, but Kent's a very charming guy, but he's sick, and he's not quite so charming when he's sick. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a bad stomach bug, apparently, and so that I was pressed into service. Uh, my coat and bag were back there because I pro absolutely promised my wife I would be at, a, a, at a, an event at 5.15, so I would have to scoot out. And the last set of questions were really save the nasty ones that Carter will grab up. <laughs> now what we want to do is just let, let, let's introduce the panel and say, uh, say who you are and where you're from. And also, uh, what I'd like to hear each of you do is in, in less than a sentence say what the answer to the question is. The question is, as you see here, what's the right formula to bring ferry transit back? That's really what we're here for. Why aren't there a big, why isn't there a big network of, 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 of ferry transit here? So, um, as I said, my name is John Watts. I'm involved with NWA as chair and been working on harbor matters for since I was an intern. Uh, and that's been a long time. And, and uh, I, I have my own view, but I won't press it on you since I'm supposed to be the moderator uh, instead of Kent. Uh, but I think I know what Kent would say, and um, so I won't say what I think is the answer. But Carter, would you tell them who you are in case anybody doesn't know? Uh, sure, my name's Carter Kraft. Been involved with MWA since probably I was a Cub Scout. And um, now work independently as a consultant for groups like the New York Harbor School and New York City Swim and lots of water related groups. I think the answer is mixing computation and recreation. Ooh, you took my answer. I second that. I'm Paula Berry. Um, I'm a director of the Harbor District and I'm with the NYC and Company, which is the tourism and marketing arm for the city. And um, I also feel quite you know, uh, strongly that the if we could get the combination of both a commuter service and a recreational service, it would have to be subsidized, but it would be, uh, the recreational portion of it would not necessarily offset, but actually make a huge contribution to the commuter. Hi there, I'm Tom Fox from New York Water Taxi. Um, been around the harbor for quite a while on the land side, but I've been floating for the last eight years. Um, I believe it's a combination of increased public access, increased investment in infrastructure, and increasing public awareness of the value of the system. Afternoon, I'm David Hopkins, uh, Vice President of New York City Economic Development Corporation. And I guess uh, my answer would be it's a combination of uh, continued uh, residential development on the waterfront in the city and uh, integration into the broader transit network and recognition that water mass transit it is transit. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Rex Rodasto. I'm with the New York City Office of Emergency Management. Uh, and I'll kind of echo what uh, David uh, just said because uh, he is kind of the, uh, the expert in terms of uh, ferry operations when it comes to New York City. But uh, linking uh, the ferry transportation with emergency management and um, finding out different ways to increase uh, facility landings and things like that uh, within the region. Hi, my name is Pierre Belen and uh, I'm with HDR. Uh, I head up an economics uh, practice in uh, our New York office and uh, over the years I've been involved in quite a few ferry, passenger ferry feasibility studies, 
um, and, and master plans. Um, I think that all the, I agree with all the points raised. Um, I definitely agree with um, uh, the, uh, the one of the keys being just simply access to uh, to peers and also increasing residential uh, density uh, uh, close to the water are all prerequisites uh, for increasing passenger fair use. Well, good. That, uh, with that somewhat uh, <clears throat> unconventional start, uh, I think we have talked about the essence, so let's uh, get into uh, what's standing in the way of uh, the, that, that vision uh, of that vision being realized. And I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists to speak very shortly about <coughs> that, and then I'd like I'd really like to see a discussion come up because uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. I can remember uh, when we had a lot more um, water taxi. I used to commute regularly uh, uh, from Brooklyn uh, from the Fulton Street up to 34th, I guess it was stop. And it was an absolutely delightful thing. I said, "Hey, this is terrific." And then I went down there one day, and there was a big sort of morning ribbon around the thing. <laughs> uh, so what happened? And uh, uh, Carter, could you address uh, from years to oh? And by the way, uh, I guess everybody here knows if they don't, they should. That Ken Barwick, who is not me, or Ken Barwick and and Carter were the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance when it started out uh, under the auspices of the Municipal Arts Society. And between the two of them, they hatched all this stuff that you see uh, today. 600 folks really passionate about uh, the harbor. Uh, Carter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, should we? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm not. Uh, all right, I'm sorry. Who's that? Next is Rex. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, the slides are in order. Okay, okay. Well, let's see who's going to speak next. <laughs> We're actually virtual. We are virtual people. Do we know uh, slideshow. Okay, is it just one upon another? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. It looks like it. Pierre is virtual. Okay, Pierre. I guess uh, we'll do it that way. Pierre, Pierre would you uh, give us your thoughts? Sure, sure. Sir. Thanks a lot. No, you, you can't turn the lights down, otherwise it won't work. Uh, the, reason, uh, the reason I was, we decided as a group that I would start is because of my involvement in, in, uh, in, in uh, a series of uh, ferry feasibility studies. Um, I've come into contact with the existing ferry service uh, quite a bit here in, in the region, and, and I thought that I would uh, put out a few points uh, about the, the existing uh, service, and particularly focusing on the uh, the, the private passenger <coughs> ferry uh, service, although we'll say a couple of words about the public one, the, the Staten Island ferry as well. And and hopefully this would be the basis for, for some of the points that would be raised by some of the other uh, panels. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? So this is, uh, just so people who aren't familiar, or for people who are, just to recap, this is uh, a, a map of the existing uh, fair passenger ferry service in the region. Um, a couple of one of those routes is, is no longer in operation, the Yonkers route. But uh, what you see is basically, um, you know, the you, you see a lot of the, the cross Hudson routes that, that mostly go to uh, Pier 79 or Pier uh, 11 from the New Jersey side, from St. George to Pier 11 is is the Staten Island ferry, which is you know the big. Uh, the, the, the big numbers in terms of passenger volumes. Um, and then you've got a couple of routes, uh, you know, the routes that are served by, by, by Tom um, uh, in, uh, on, on the New York side and in the East River. Um, and then down below you've got the, uh, the Monmouth County routes um, that are uh, a little bit, as we'll talk, they're, 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 they're definitely distinct from, from the other routes. So this is the core of the system. Uh, other than the Staten Island Ferry, it's 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 privately run. Do you want to go to the next one? I think that if one wants to understand what works with passenger ferries and um, uh, and, and and what doesn't, I mean, there, there's quite a few things in in the mix. But certainly, one I think one of the most interesting things to, to do is to look at um, if you look at this is a map of that same region. And what I've done here, this is from a past uh, project. And this is a little bit dated because it's from the 2000 census, but what I've done here is map um, what the market capture is for ferry commutation. 
from different census tracts. So, you know, what that means is where you see darker colors or <coughs> non-white colors getting to darker, the darker color is the higher the proportion of that census tract that's going to lower Manhattan by ferry. And you see some of these census tracts are, 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 are surprisingly high, like uh, specifically some of these in Monmouth County, and a couple of them, uh, Weehawken and, and Hoboken. And, and you also have some, uh, and, and the lesson learned here is really this point that was raised by a couple of us here on the panel initially is, um, you know, one of the keys to uh, a successful passenger uh, uh, passenger ferry service um, is to have these densities of people uh, near where the, path, the ferry is going to leave. Also, on the receiving end, this other map shows you where where people are going. And again, this is Lower Manhattan, but you see a very similar story if you're looking at Midtown. But you see, these people are going from you know fairly tightly packed areas close to these piers, and they're going to places very close to the pier, to either Pier 11, uh, or else uh, Pier 79, uh, or, or World Financial Center. So, you know, the, essentially, they, you're not going to go very, you're not going to get a lot of market capture when you start moving away from the pier, or uh, on, on either the origin or the destination side. Um, so just a couple of quick numbers, just to give you an idea of the scale, because I think sometimes it surprises people um, just how how large the existing private passenger uh, ferry system is in the region. So it's today it's roughly about 29,000 daily passengers in the weekday, and some of these major routes are you know Weehawken to Pier 79, uh, Hoboken to Pier 11, Paulus Hook to Pier 11. All these the, the New Jersey route the, these New Jersey lines tend to generate um, a lot of uh, big numbers for. Primarily the reasons uh, that we saw on that, that map. You know, a lot of people live close to the pier and they're commuting to Midtown or to, uh, or to Lower Manhattan. Now the system is unique uh, when you compare it to uh, passenger ferry services really anywhere in the world, uh, I believe, um, certainly in the United States and in Canada, and that it's, it's, uh, it's primarily uh, it's, it's, it's self-sustaining from the fare box. Now it doesn't mean there are a couple of routes that do receive subsidies, but the, the, the core of that system is self-sustaining uh, from the fare box. Not to say that it's not a challenge to make these routes work, uh, but uh, this is one of the things that makes this system unique. Uh, not only a passenger ferry, but you know we're talking about ferries as transit, certainly as, as transit. Uh, when you look at the other major systems, Washington State, Boston, Vancouver, or the Bay Area, they all have varied levels of, of operating support. For example, in Boston, um, the, the, the operating subsidy is on the order of 50%. In Vancouver, it's, uh, it's on the order of, 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 almost, uh, uh, of almost 30%. Um, so what, recently, without going into a, a, a long history of this passenger uh, of, of the system, um, I, I think many of you are aware of the fact that after 9-11, there was a, a you know, with the, the path being out of service, um, to lower my hand, there was a huge increase, uh, more than doubling of the, the number of, of ferry riders. Um, with the reopening of the path, things went back to that sort of steady state uh, for, for the system. Roughly in the, in the, in the mid uh, 30, 35,000, 34,000 daily passenger level. Uh, but it's dropped about 15% in the last couple of years, which is, uh, it is significant. Now, I've done a fair amount of analysis of, 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 of why that happens, and my conclusion is it's actually pretty simple. There's not really a big mystery for that, at least from, from my perspective. Uh, the reason for this fall is that, uh, one, there were some, some, some fuel cost related fare increases in 2008, but the biggest reason for this decrease um, is really that uh, the, the, the ferry service is very closely tied to financial or, or, uh, or, or producer services. Uh, employment in Manhattan, and it's very sensitive to it. So if you have a 10%, a 1% fall in in, 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 in in employment in the financial sector, you'll have more than 1% fall in the uh, in the ridership uh, of the system. Um, so just a couple of key points, since the question that we're trying to answer is, uh, you know. What could be done to make this the, a, 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 the system to expand the, the scope of this system? Um, what are some key points that, that I, I might suggest are, are good to keep in mind? Um, first of all, going back to some of these these issues in terms of you know, what works, 
and what doesn't for this system. Um, I'm going to point out that I'm going back and not again not going too much into the history of the system, but um, since 1986, there's been about 70 routes in the region have started have been started. Today, there's only 24, um, and so. It, it sort of is also the nature of the of, of the mode of ferry system uh, that you get a lot of startups and some of them succeed, some of them some of them don't. But the fact is that you have this uh, this this almost this laboratory experiment for what works and, and what doesn't. And remember that what works and what doesn't in this region typically means uh, uh, you have to pay, you have to be self-sustaining out of the fare box. So what works and what doesn't is again this point of of the of the, uh, the, 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 the location of the users has to be where they live, has to be very proximate to landings, and where they are going has to be uh, proximate to these, to these landings. <laughs> or there has to be very good access to them. And I think going back, we don't have to go back, but you saw there, if some of you noticed, some of the, there are some areas that say in New Jersey, in Union County, for example, where there's a high capture of, of ferry, uh, by the ferry service, even though they are not near, uh, they're they're not near a landing. That's because they're they're in Morristown or in Summit, and they're right on a train line that's going to take them right to Hoboken. Um, the, the, but in general, in terms of, of uh, another factor of what works and what doesn't uh, for for a passenger ferry service line is it has to really be offering uh, it has to be offering on the one hand. Uh, a, a benefit to the users. Either it has to be offering uh, a s significant time saving. It's also offering comfort. That's a that's a, a, a big part of the equation, but also the one that's probably the least well understood. Um, and or it also has to be offering a, a, a service where uh, the the existing the existing transit options just simply are, are not as attractive. Now, from the operating side, success and again from this being ability to be self-sustaining, the, the, the formula that, that seems to work uh, very well are these short point-to-point -point routes between uh, New Jersey and New York. They're sort of the art type. You're not traveling very far, you don't have high operating costs, and you're also filling all your boats. And so you're, uh, that's, that's one of the ways that you, you, you get that fare box coverage. Let me go to the next one. Just to illustrate some of this, this is from some, some this is just to give you an example. These are areas where, these are, municipalities that have a high uh, uh, proportion of people using the ferry going to Manhattan up for commutation. And what you see here is that, you know, what's the ferry offer offering them? Well, for Atlantic Highlands, it's offering them a substantial time saving, even though they're paying a lot. This is a specific market that's a little bit different. They're saving 20 minutes, but they're paying a lot of money to save that 20 minutes a day. But it's also a relatively high income uh, 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 series of communities, and they've also self-selected in the sense that they're they're living in a place and working in another place, which uh, which requires a long commute. So this is a, a slightly different market. People are are ready to spend time and money to get to work. For Hoboken, the story is a little bit different. Uh, here, it's a short commute to, to Manhattan, but look at the, the the dramatic time improvement that the ferry offers you. And the same story for Port Imperial, which is. Uh, you know, the, 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 the route other than the Staten Island Ferry with the largest daily ridership. Um, sort of a similar, going a little bit deeper into this question, again, just to illustrate what it is that the ferry routes that are, that are self-sustaining and, and generating a lot of ridership, what are they offering? Sort of the same situation here. Now, this is, a, a, these are uh, areas in Monmouth County. Again, you know, Monmouth County, that long ferry ride, it costs you a fair amount of money. Um, uh, but Again, um, what, what, you, what you see is that you've got uh, people are mostly, by and large, either taking the train or the ferry. And the ferry is the, the most popular mode from, from Monmouth County to Lower Manhattan, which is uh, certainly makes this a, a, an interesting case study. So people are paying a lot, but again, they're paying a lot for that for, for uh, a substantial time saving, and they're 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 starting off as rel they're relatively wealthy, and they're willing to their value of time is high. And they're going to spend a lot of money to, to spend to save that 20 minutes, plus the comfort factor. You want to go into and then one final slide again, it's the same sort of story, uh, and this is for Hudson and Bergen County, and these are short commutes. Uh, the path and the ferry are the main, uh, the, the major uh, modes to get to to get to Lower Manhattan, and they're very similar in terms of what they're offering in terms of in vehicle time, 
sort of similar in terms of, 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 of uh, out-of-pocket costs, uh, but I think that one of the things that you see is that, that the ferry is seen, um, and this comes out from surveys, and uh, that the ferry is seen as, as a more comfortable option, and it's also one that this is a market where people tend to use it uh, not every single day. They, they'll, they'll use it on occasion. The weather's nice in the summer, uh, and so the path and the, the ferry here are seen as more interchangeable. Uh, so finally, just um, uh, some some things to keep in mind uh, as we discuss this issue of expanding uh, expanding ferry service. One of the things in terms of expanding uh, ridership for existing routes is that um, these existing routes seem to have captured a lot of the the market that they're going to capture at their given fare level. So in order to capture to increase, so Monmouth County or Weehawken, in order to increase that market, they have to start reducing fares. Uh, one, my estimates, and, and they, they're backed up by, 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 uh, by uh, quite a few other similar studies, is that the, the, how people respond to prices for this market is very similar to transit in general. So fare is pretty, what's called inelastic, which means that if you increase, uh, if you decrease fares by 10%, you're gonna get less than a 10% increase in ridership. In fact, it's gonna be significantly less but it's going to be more on the order of 2 to 3%. So that's something to keep in mind with these existing routes. What can you get by, by subsidizing fares? I, you know, not, not arguing against it, it's just that that seems to be what might be the effect. Now in terms of new routes, one of the things that I think is really important, and, 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 and maybe this is something that, that, that others on the panel can back up, is that what what, I've, what I think is, is important to remember is that familiarity with, uh, with ferry travel itself is really important in the sense that if you're going to a new market where there is no existing ferry service and people just simply aren't familiar with it, it's going to either, either you're going you're gonna to tend to overstate the demand that if, you're, if you're basing it on what happens on the cross-Hudson uh, routes, for example. Mostly just because people don't know the route, uh, they don't know the mode, and when they're making that trade-off between, let's say, subway and ferries, they're not really quite sure how to compare the two. And so that means that either you're going to overestimate demand initially, or it's going to take you quite a while for that demand to, to ramp up, as they say. Um, and I think that's... Uh, well, here, I think you're about to run out of your five minutes here, so... Um, <laughs> that's my last slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll come back in questions to that, but... Uh, <laughs> Are, you are looking at existing routes and existing traffic. The places that don't have routes, you don't know what the traffic might be. No, no, I've looked a lot at uh, existing at, at, uh, at new routes as well, and uh, I've, it's, I've done I've done it for for both. I mean, so I'm drawing conclusions from. Well, from it would be interesting to get into how you do it when there when there's no real data, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, David to okay. make his comments and. To, Oh, is it Tom next? Okay, Tom, are you next up? Right. All right, whoever slides up. And please be sure to speak consistently to the microphone so we get I have a hard time speaking consistently to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. I'll give it my best. Um, I just wanted to start with a sense of what the system could be. Uh, we're talking about subsidizing a ferry system, and uh, I believe that uh, I'm a former National Park Service Ranger, and if you look around our region, there are 10 parks, all on four-lane highways within 50 miles of New York City. Collectively, they have 48,000 parking spaces that are not used at all during the spring, summer, and fall, spring, winter, and fall, and are only used at 20% of capacity during the summer. So to me, this is the first ring of high-speed, long-haul ferries, similar to the Monmouth County ferries, be they along I-95 in Sherwood Island State Park in Connecticut, or along the um, LIE in the Sunken Meadow. The nice thing is that they were all designed by the dreaded Mr. Mo Moses, uh, who put four-lane roads to the parks, and there's no houses around the park. So it's not like there's any uh, NIMBY issues. Nobody's going to be seeing the parking coming in, and it's all on developed highways. Now, if you fantasize along with me, I see the East River as the Grand Canal. I see expresses and locals. I see an uptown in red. I see a downtown in green. I see an express in blue. It connects to the airport. 
we need to have an integrated system where you can transfer from boat to boat and actually go somewhere. Same thing that goes for the west side and express in the local. Now, all of these sites are being developed along the waterfront from um, Riverside South down to the northern end of Hell's Kitchen to Greenwich Village. There are 1,200 people in Greenwich Village who work in Lower Manhattan. So, you know, there is a market being created on the west side. And in on my beloved Brooklyn, you have uh, neighborhoods like Red Hook and Atlantic Basin near Cobble Hill and Atlantic Avenue um, that can provide another commuter service into town. Uh, now, there has been a history of subsidized services in the city. We participated in several of them. There's one really screaming success in subsidized services, and that's the Trans Hudson service going from west of Hudson in Putnam County to the train line um, and east of Hudson, so Havistraw, Asne. Uh, those services are actually feeding into a larger mass transit system and doing um, what Pierre had said there, taking people who are captured on one side of the river and their time going over the Tappan Zee or the George Washington Bridge is phenomenal. We've had two other subsidies. One was Havistraw and Yonkers, which we ran. And um, one thing you learn is you cannot compete against subsidized mass transit when you're not subsidized mass transit. The train runs every five minutes. For the boat to run every five minutes, we would have to invest $25 million in capital just to get the number of boats to be doing that frequency. It makes no sense to have a redundant system along existing mass transit lines unless in, there's a case of emergency, which we found that when there were Metro North problems, slews of people came on to the Yonkers have a straw run, which means they knew about it, but they didn't use it on a regular basis because you had to park your car and pass the train station to walk to the ferry stop. Doesn't really work. Second one was the Rockaway service. Our dear friend Joe Hardigan is here. I'm sure he won't pipe in, but um, the Rockaway service did not succeed for a number of reasons. Joe would say the boats were slow. We didn't run them properly and it wasn't marketed. Um, my problem is that we didn't have a stop on the other side <coughs> on Brooklyn. If you look at Marine Park, Bergen Beach, Georgetown, Brighton Beach, Mill Basin, all the, the non mass transit served communities on the south shore of Brooklyn. Floyd Bennett Field has 1,200 acres of six foot runways that are perfect parking lots. It's got the old Navy, uh, the old uh, biplane, uh, uh, seaplane ramp where the first transatlantic flight left from. Um, I used to be a ranger in Gateway back in the Middle Ages and there was, um, there was a thought of waterborne transportation being the way to get to Gateway National Recreation Area. I still believe it is. And I believe that a Rockaway service that doesn't stop on the other side of the bridge where there's 50,000 cars a day going along the Belt Parkway just hitting the molasses as they get to, to Flatbush Avenue is somewhat foolish. So what, what do I think? I mean, I've had the good fortune of traveling around the world. Um, uh, Istanbul carries 100 million people a year. They have 99 vessels. They have their own shipyard. They have 12 uh, harbor cleaners. And they're all paid for by the public. Um, and this has been going on ever since the Bosporus has been there and armies have moved back and forth across that strait of water. Uh, in Sydney, Australia, their system is you go down to Central Quay, You'll see signs lighted up for Manly and the Parramatta River, and but it's all subsidized. It's all government funded. If you go to Venice and you travel around in the Vaporetti, uh, you'll see that uh, that system too is subsidized by the Acha TV, which is an Italian mass transit system that oversees the Venetian uh, mass transit system. But it's got differential fares, which is what I think would work here in New York. Or if you're a New Yorker and you buy your monthly ticket, it's three dollars a ride. And if you're Joe Blow from Istanbul or Venice or Jane Doe coming to take a ride on the ferry, it's ten bucks because the tourists have discretionary income. That red, that addition to the fare box is a good way of offsetting local fares. Um, but I think the real key to all of this is integration with the MTA. If you look at London, for example, the Thames Clippers, um, ever since the July 8th bombing of the, the tube there, they have been integrated into the oyster system. 
So it can transfer from the tube to the bus to the to the uh, train to the to the boat seamlessly without worrying about changing. Sorry, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Continue with us. Um, without without um, without thinking that you're moving from one system to the other. So the three things that I think are going to make the system work here in New York City is public investment in the infrastructure. I mean, we're going to open an East River service, and if you go to Greenpoint Williamsburg, there are no docks there. So, you know, in London, they build docks on the Thames River that actually have lavatories and, um, you know, information systems, and they're heated and air conditioned. And I think we have to look at our system as something more of, you know, those are the necessities in my mind, not the amenities. If you don't have a place to sit and it's raining, whether it's the summer or the winter, or if you've got the north wind blowing into your teeth, you're not going to come down there a second time because it's easier to slip down into the snake and go to work. So how do we make it pleasurable? How do we bring people in? That's public investment. Um, private investment is our job. Um, we build boats. One of my water taxis costs $2.65 million. Um, that's a lot of money for a boat. So we're making a capital investment in boats. Uh, one would suggest that perhaps uh, OEM could help us, or not OEM, but one of the agencies under their jurisdiction, with doing a finance program that makes it easier to acquire boats. Because if it's easier or cheaper for us to acquire boats, it lowers one of our critical costs, and it provides them with the kinds of services they need in emergencies, which is the equipment that if the economy doesn't work here, is not down in Florida somewhere working, it's actually here in the harbor. And the last is political will. And that's an intangible that, you know, looking around the room from some of the uh, elderly, elderly, <laughs> not elderly, but my younger colleagues like uh, Bill Wood, that we've been sitting in these rooms for 20 years talking about the same thing. And the wonderful thing about this conference is, who are these people? There's all these new faces, all this young blood, all this sense of future and potential. I think that that's what's going to make the ferry system work is people getting down there. My favorite story is coming from Battery Park City over to uh, Red Hook in Brooklyn with some kids going over to um, Ikea and their pudgy little hands. You know, they're on the bow rocking back and forth and their fathers are standing behind them with pails and the water's splashing up in their faces and they're laughing and I realized we got them. <laughs> you know, they're ours for life. So I think the two things, the two things that would help our system is that every child in every school get out on a ferry once a year and see what it's like to be on the water. It's their natural heritage, it's their historic heritage. And I think two is give us, you know, like the Second Avenue subway or the, give us 10 years and a billion dollars. Um, my dream small. But this is a huge system. They spent $350 million on Trans Hudson. We could have those parks humming in terms of long distance, long haul runs connected into the city if the scale of the investment was on the level of the scale of the potential benefit, the importance to the environment, and the importance to the economy of the city. Thank you. David, I think you're next since you've got economic in your title. Uh, how come uh, we can't get it across that we make money or that, that, that other people have studied it carefully and say that because you don't have to spend very much money repairing the road, uh, that if you came close to what you spent in other means, in terms of you know marginal ridership costs of maintenance, mm -hmm. Uh, you would quickly rush to subsidize ferries at a lower level in order to make more money. Now, that, that's been proved in some cities by careful analysis, but we haven't gotten around to that concept, as Tom says, in the voters' mind. Because once we got the concept in the voters' mind, it might uh, translate through to our elected officials. Well, I, th I think a lot of it comes back to the sort of unique way that the ferry system has developed in New York Harbor, and, and Pierre hit on that. Uh, Tom, you're the best advocate we have for, for ferry service in the city, and I sort of wanted to give a little bit about the city's perspective, because we have made a, a massive capital commitment in this region to supporting ferry service from the public sector. If you look at the total amount of money that's been spent on infrastructure for terminals in the region in the last 20 years, right. it's about $700 million. Now, $300 million of that is rebuilding two Staten Island ferry terminals, 
but the rest of it was to support the private sector ferry network that's developed along, uh, particularly across the Trans-Hudson. Uh, so we, we also have a very bifurcated system here. One thing people don't know is that the New York system is the biggest system in the country. Uh, but we've got the biggest single route ferry, net ferry route in the nation, which is the Staten Island Ferry. And we've got the most robust system of private operators in the, in the nation uh, that together carry millions of people every year, um, about 30 million people in the, in the area. Um, so I think the issue becomes what is the role of the public sector in terms of supporting that moving forward. Uh, we've got a model that's somewhat unique that's developed. Uh, we think that there uh, is a potential to increase the role of ferry service in the harbor, but it's probably not going to be that, pri that purely private sector model that's been operating up until now. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention was uh, when does it make sense to cross that threshold and to subsidize service from the public sector's purse? And there, there, the Regional Plan Association did a great study a few years ago and looked at the, the criteria under which it might make sense for the public sector to step in. And, and Pierre and Tom have talked about some of those already. Areas that aren't well served by existing transit, as you know, the city grew, uh, really uh, had the waterfront devoted to industry. The mass transit options didn't go directly to the waterfront, so now that we're building on the waterfront, the, the connections to transit are not great. Uh, so, tra so ferries can be more convenient, they can be more comfortable. There are also instances where ferry services relieve overcrowding on existing transit networks, and the PATH service is a great example of that. If those people, 30,000 people riding across the Hudson, had to go on the PATH tomorrow, the Port Authority would have to build a, a significant investment in capital infrastructure. So they've shed a load to the ferry system, and they've, they've avoided a significant capital expenditure. There's also a ferry service role in terms of supporting waterfront development. Um, and then a potential connection to public recreation areas that Paul is going to talk about, and a potential for emergency evacuation capability that Rex is going to talk about that's been proven time and again will be needed in times of emergency to evacuate people from Manhattan. So I want to go to uh, briefly uh, the role of the city of New York here. Uh, ferry service was actually recognized in Plan YC uh, as one of the elements of the transportation program. And Tom mentioned uh, one of the elements was the Rockaways pilot program, which we ran for two years. Another element is a citywide ferry study that we're conducting jointly with the New York Harborway. Uh, that effort is being finalized. It's looking at the market demand from a number of locations in the city for ferry service. It's looking at the potential for linking some of those destinations together in transit light corridors. And it's looking at the potential synergy between recreational service and commuter service and how you can make the, most, the best use of your resources by looking at both those markets together. Uh, but what I really want to talk about in the last couple of minutes here is what Commissioner Burton mentioned in her presentation this morning at the plenary session, and that is the launch of our East River Pilot Program next spring. Um, we are looking to connect a number of destinations along the East River in Brooklyn and Queens to Lower Manhattan and to Midtown Manhattan. So we're going to see uh, Long Island City at Hunters Point South, uh, Greenpoint at India Street, North Williamsburg at North 6th Street where the Edge development is being built, South Williamsburg at about South 8th Street where the Schaefer Landing condominiums are, and Fulton Ferry Landing connected in a transit-like corridor where you'll see service going both northbound and southbound along that corridor connecting to Midtown and Wall Street. Um, we're currently building the infrastructure that's necessary to support that service. Um, if you live in Greenpoint, you've probably seen some pile driving going on in India Street. Uh, a private developer is building a pier that the service will use there. Um, similarly, we're finishing up the ferry landing and float for the North Williamsburg site. And we hope to have that infrastructure in place next spring so that we can open the service. We're also in negotiations with operators over running the service. And we have funding for two to three years of service uh, to put out on the water and to test a number of assumptions that we've been talking about theoretically here and see if they really do pan out as a viable option for, for ferry service. Um, what's different about the ferry service that we're starting up on the East River? First of all, I mentioned it's transit-like routing. We really don't think with the level of waterfront development that's occurred along the, the Brooklyn Queens waterfront so far that you've got the, the market for those point-to-point -point services that you see in New Jersey. Over time, hopefully they'll develop. Instead, we'll link these destinations together. 
but we'll also have transit-like frequencies. Um, some of the criticism of previous ferry efforts have been that the boat comes along every 45 minutes or every hour. We're aiming to have service every 20 minutes in the peak. That service would continue uh, at, at lower frequencies during the off-peak, but it would be all day long. We'd have a long span of service running from roughly 7 in the morning to 8 at night. We'd have um, service on the weekends. So really, people can rely on the service, and they know the service is going to be there, so if they go to work in the middle of the day, they can come back. Uh, if they go to work in the morning and they need to get home in the middle of the day, they can use that service to get home. So we're going to test a lot of things over the next uh, two or three years. How we can integrate commuter recreational service, is the ridership demand there? Um, what kind of marketing techniques are useful to get people to make the choice to walk to the water instead of walking up to the crowded L train? Uh, what kind of ticketing services are we going to have? Uh, what, what fare levels are people going to respond to? How can we improve intermodal connectivity? All those issues are going to be tested by this service. And therefore, I think, based on this pilot program, the city can come back and make a decision in the future about whether this is a, a service that's worthy of expanding and having actually be an integral part of our transit system. I mentioned that those two things at the beginning of the presentation in terms of waterfront uh, development and residential densities and the need to hopefully integrate these ferry services into the regional trans transit system. So that's just a quick overview of, uh, of what's happening at EDC and um, we look forward to working with you as we uh, get the service up and running. water or something, but it's really remarkable. I mean, some of you have been, you know, we've been at this since 8 o'clock today, and, you know, the, the room is packed. It's really impressive, and it really is. A, it's our spirit, I think, and what the water does. Anyway, I'm Paula Berry. I'm with uh, New York uh, Company, uh, which is the tourism and marketing arm for the city, and our charge is to link the waterfront parks and make them into a singular destination. Our competition is Central Park, and um, what we hope in the future is that people consider um, the waterfront as they do Central Park as a place to go for their leisure. We have the bike trails that are, the bikeways that are linking them, the connections, and of course, the ferries will make or break whether or not the Harbor Way parks become something singular. So, what I'd like to share with you very quickly is an experiment that we conducted this summer, which was, uh, our hypothesis is that, was that uh, we believe that people would indeed pay for recreational ferry service and we wanted to test that and we wanted to test it and the timing was so great because we were testing it at the time when the Brooklyn Bridge Park had just opened. So Brooklyn Bridge Park opens, we decide okay let's see if people will uh, enjoy the vision that we have which is to move not just be at one park but to move from park to park and also pay for it. So. We, uh, with the great help of the New York Water Taxi, we racked a ferry and called it NY Harbor Way. And this past summer, we had a um, ferry operation, which was conducted for 13 Fridays. We discounted it, the service. It was from 10 o'clock to 4 in the afternoon. And it's this rectangle that moved from Fulton Ferry Land to South Street Seaport, Governor's Island, and Pier 6. And the cost of it, a one-way ticket was $2. A round trip ticket was $3, and the family ride was $6, which included two adults and two children. And we promoted it. Uh, I, I think we did, we had very little money to promote it. We blasted it uh, on email. We did everything we could possibly do virally. Um, we, you know, we are sitting at NYC and Co., which has this extraordinary website, which has really a lot of traffic. So we, we did everything we could, but really on a shoestring. We just wanted to see would people come. So this is, these were our numbers. We, we, wait a minute, let me back up. We, amongst ourselves, we thought, okay, if we can get 500 people by the end of the summer riding the ferry and paying for it, the water taxi and paying for it, 
will feel really great about this whole thing. Well, the end of the story is that, in fact, our best day was over 1,800 people. Um, and they paid, you know, and you can see consistently how uh, the summer, through the course of the summer, had improved and the number of people riding it uh, kept increasing. And um, what this did was, for the first time, I, I, I hate to say it, so it's the real data that shows that the recreational portion, just people paying for recreation, can be done. You know, we can charge. Uh, so we had total riders of 13,000. Uh, the fares offset the cost by about 70%, and the total volume grew by about three and a half times from the beginning to the end of the summer. Which, what does this mean? And what does this mean primarily to the East River Ferry Service? Which is that there is, there are off-peak hours where one could take those ferries and when they're not being used for commuter service, they could be used for recreational and people would pay and a different group and a different market would pay and that would offset the <coughs> subsidy. So when you think subsidy for the commuter, what we're hoping is that as we plan for the commuter subsidy ferry service that we link it with recreational. Thank you. Well, uh, last we have uh, Carter, who I introduced. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, we got Rex. Uh, Rex, would you please uh, give us uh, three to five minutes of your best thoughts on this topic? Sure. Uh, my name is Rex Vanasso. I'm with the New York City Office of Emergency Management. And while I can't write Tom a check for $2.5 million, I will uh, give his industry some praise in terms of their emergency uh, response capabilities and how they've helped us uh, in, in different events. Uh, can you just love this? Sure. Slide show. So I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about you know the different uh, emergency uh, incidents where we've had the assistance from the, the ferry providers and they've been well documented and all over the news. But in, in terms of uh, the purview of the emergency manager, this isn't necessarily our strong point. However, where we do fit in, we do support the uh, the different city agencies that have the uh, the authority over uh, these issues as well as their uh, the, uh, the vessel operators and um, the companies. Uh, you know we do things like. Uh, we, uh, we write uh, waivers, or we assist with writing waivers for uh, extending pairs and, and different landings uh, in the event that you know, we do want to provide emergency access and to alleviate crowd conditions, uh, which we've seen uh, during numerous events. On the water side of the operation, um, the, the ferry providers, as I said earlier, have been a very tremendous uh, resource to us, and they've helped us uh, based on the three points that, uh, that are outlined up there. And I'll just go through them uh, really quickly. Next slide. So in terms of first response emergencies, uh, ferry providers provide us with increased uh, emergency response capabilities. Uh, as you can see, that's evident uh, during flight 1549, uh, the, uh, the New York waterway was, uh, was very critical in getting to the scene and was the first, uh, the first boats on the scene to, uh, to, to get some of those people from the, uh, from the downed aircraft. Uh, the men and women on the uh, ferry operators are very trained and willing to respond to emergency incidents, as we've seen uh, do numerous uh, times. And also, they act as a awareness and a, uh, a watchful eye on the on the waterways, as they're the most uh, I wouldn't say I, I, well, I would say competent, but they're very uh, they're very keen to to the waterways, and they know the waterways, and they can provide that insight and visibility into different operations or different suspicious activity that may be going on and, and provide that information to the appropriate parties. Next slide. So during uh, no notice emergency transfer, uh, no, no notice emergency operations, uh, we've seen that they've uh, stepped up to the plate once again uh, during 9-11, uh, evacuating people from lower Manhattan, which is very crucial in, in uh, getting people out the way, and also uh, replacing the path service, which was added at some time, in, and filling that void. Also, they also provide redundant transportation. This is kind of the scene at the uh, the Pier 79 landing in uh, in Midtown Manhattan during the 2003 blackout. As you can see, it's a pretty crowded condition, and <laughs> and while you know it's not necessarily the uh, the most ideal situation you'd like to have as an emergency manager, but you can see that. <laughs> 
the ferry operators are willing to step in. Uh, we have worked with our uh, with the private vessel uh, subcommittee as well as our city agencies, ensuring that incidents like these aren't repeated, where you do have crowd uh, crowding issues like that with the local and having local law enforcement and city agencies at the uh, at the ready to uh, to assist. And as Tom mentioned earlier, we also, they also provide alternate transportation modes. So during the transit strike. They were uh, they were pretty essential in, in moving people back and forth when New York City uh, Transit uh, decided to uh, to stop running. And also, uh, as Tom mentioned earlier, when Metro North has problems or Path has problems, you see increased ridership along the uh, the different ferry routes. So um, it, it also augments and connects service. So you know, uh, ferry landings like Hunters Point in Queens, which are uh, which are located near uh, other transportation facilities, which many of the panelists have said earlier about linking the uh, the transportation modes together is a way of uh, increasing the uh, increasing and having some rationale for increasing uh, operations on the ferries. And with that, that's kind of my brief. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just have a Carter. Uh, uh, Carter's going to cover many hats. I mentioned earlier, my wife's waiting for me uptown to do something I invited her to. Uh, and so uh, I may disappear soon. Uh, Carter is uh, Mr. Everything, though, and was pretty much the embodiment of this organization out in the public for a long time and is now a professional solver of problems in this area. And he's got some problems uh, facing him with these questions. But uh, I'd like to ask him, my, my last pitch, though, is remember that careful studies in San Francisco that were, were so well done that they were believable was that you save money by subsidizing ferries. It's a simple point. And if you think of what, you want, how much it costs to get out there, take a road that's been overused or, or put a new lane in, uh, if you get careful with the economics, you lower your taxes. When you give Tom some money, it's quite important. Thank you, John. And um, in five quick slides, um, you know, as Tom mentioned earlier, you can blame anything for the Rockaway, uh, the failure of the service. But as, as David points out, the best place to go back and maybe consider restarting routes is places that have been tried before. If you took every one of those Rockaway boats that went back empty last summer and the summer before, and instead put kids from the Farragut Houses you know, youth program down uh, next to the Navy Yard, or Settlement House Henry Street kids from the Lower East Side, and sent them on the backhaul empty trip out to the Rockaways, whether for education and nature education, or you know, even possibly learning to swim on the Jamaica Bay side as opposed to the Rockaway side. There's a lot of great natural recreation that can be enjoyed out there. But 150 kids on a boat, $5 a head, which is what somebody like the National Parks of New York Harbor or a summer programmer might be willing to pay, $750 an hour to an operator, you know, has a tremendous impact on the bottom line, even if it's not all day long. Um, another aspect I think where you know, we can do better as a community and a water transit community, and, and to Rex's point, it's great to see OEM here. You know, I remember during the transit strike in 06, you know, back at the Waterfront Alliance then, and there were all these bulletins being posted on city websites about supplementary ferry service on how to get to work. And they had listings for ferries from World's Fair Marina to downtown, and ferries from uh, what we now call uh, whatever the, uh, what's the old Barren Island Marina out at Gateway, to get to uh, Gateway Marina to Midtown. And actually in 2006, those ferry services weren't running. You know, those had been invented hastily in the early 2000s. We called City DOT to say, hey, you've got these things on your website, you know, and they're not running. You should take them down. And DOT told us at the time, well, it's going to take us 24 to 48 hours to update that information on the web. So fortunately, five years later, we've really come a long way. But to the point of the CERT program and community emergency response team, you know, we've got a growing number of educational facilities and programs. City Maritime there in the top right, Kingsborough Community College and the Harbor School, as many of you know, out on, the, out on Governor's Island, which could be sort of a ready reserve core to support water transit and mobility and user information and rider information um, during those times of stress. I don't want freight ferries to totally get lost. There was a, had an interesting discussion with Christina right here on the front row talking about bringing a boatload of produce down to a community supported agriculture 
group in the Bronx. She said, the farmer wants to do it, and the CSA wants to do it, and we should bring it all by barge down from upstate. I said, well, how much does it cost? She said, well, we're trying to cost it out, but the truck only costs $187. And I thought, oh my God, next question, please. But when you look at the whole picture, you know, you see that there really could be some opportunities out there. And then follow up to David's study and then Pierre's work for the Port Authority and others, you know, there's a freight piece, which we understand is complicated logistically, it's complicated in terms of labor, it's complicated by the number of times something has to be handled. But there might be things like a truck ferry from the Port Authority's new Greenville Yards facility on the Upper Bay in Jersey City to move stuff over to the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal at 39th Street or the Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Take stuff off the Verrazano Bridge, you know, take stuff off the uh, congested canal street corridor. There might be something even really local like a truck ferry going from the Brooklyn Navy Yard to East Midtown. You know, one of the largest suppliers of office supplies in the city has their operation in the Navy Yard. And imagine if all those truck drivers came to work at East 34th Street and picked up their truck there off the barge instead of going all the way into the Navy Yard to get to work, maybe there are some savings that can be factored in there. And even for the long haul stuff, something down around Raritan Center or the Raritan River, you know, off the South Shore of Staten Island on the New Jersey side, sort of Middlesex County, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for some of the long haul trucks who want to avoid the driving through the metropolitan area and the unreliable travel times that we have here. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's not just factoring in how much the tolls and the driver time is costed uh, on both sides of the equation. But you know, something like a long haul ferry like that might make more use for a warehouse operator or distribution, distribution center in Western Maryland or Ohio, where by the time the truck gets to the metropolitan area, that truck driver needs a three hour break and they can sleep on the boat until they get off in Rhode Island or Connecticut and you factor it into a uh, longer travel trip. The last two sides, just to remind us um, about quite literally our declining influence, you know, we just had another we just had another census, and as this slide shows from the 2000 census, New York, even with its growth, and New Jersey with population growth as well, not growing as fast as other parts of the region. New York lost two congressional seats with uh, the reapportionment in 2002, and New Jersey lost one seat. And just this projection from the New York Times a month ago, it looks like New York will lose another two seats, with uh, New Jersey also losing one. So if you just go back to 1990 where you know, the beginning of that revolution in transportation policy, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, we all look at as Moynihan's legacy, you know, our region's voice in Congress has dropped by about 18% just by the increased population growth around the country. So if there's one blessing that could come with the collapse of the access to the region's core tunnel and maybe this discussion about extending the seven train, is it actually gives New York and New Jersey something to talk about except being constantly annoyed and contemptful of each other. So uh, with that, I'll just be glad that everybody still takes a regional uh, view of these things, but let's try to find some more local things to work together on. Thank you. I'm putting John's hat on since he's run off to Midtown, and we've got about eight questions. We'll uh, rifle through them. Uh, we've got five minutes, no more than. Um, we'll start with, uh, will Roosevelt Island be included in your East River Ferry pilot project? Uh, the Roosevelt Island dock is very close to the F train as well as the tram which just reopened today. So I guess that's maybe a question to David. Um, as I mentioned, the, the stops are, don't include uh, Roosevelt Island Manhattan. That's one of the sites we are analyzing our ferry study. So it has the potential to be a future location, but the, this is just linking the Brooklyn and Queens. But hopefully they'll be persuaded during cocktail hour later. Um, next question. Which cities in the U.S. have shown that increased ferry traffic reduces cars on the road over time? Anybody got ghost trick? And while you think about that, here's the next question. So hopefully somebody can answer it either. With the current problems posed to marinas, natural shorelines, and recreators like kayakers from ferry wakes, how would increasing ferries affect them? So I'll, I'll do the first one, just to, uh, since, I, since I moved here from Seattle. Um, the solution in Seattle was don't build a bridge, and therefore you will uh, ensure ferry traffic. <laughs> and really that is the nature of the service there. It connects islands and peninsulas that are not connected to the main part of the region by bridges. Um, so we've sort of seen a system that has used to be nothing but ferries wilt away when we built our bridges and tunnels, and now is experiencing a revival. 
Um, I'll, I'll take the wait question. Oh, one thing before I start. I said private sector investment was a very important part of this. The Durst organization, which has supported this conference, is the reason why New York Water Taxi exists. This is an enlightened real estate company that doesn't have property on the waterfront, that sees the future of the city being the waterfront. Um, I don't know if she's in the room, but Helena Durst is kind of stepping in for Douglas. She's our new president and CEO. And um, I, I personally am very grateful to the family for making the investment in our waterfront that they've made. Now, one of the things they've allowed us to do, Douglas is an environmentalist. And uh, I used to be the president of the Hudson River Park Conservancy, and I watched as all of my peers, they looked like tongues just lapping into the water as the waterborne traffic hit.